Hello and welcome to the Red Room. Today's guest is Omar Golan Joel from Stella Gamma. Uh, he is the author of Sifu's Deluxe and uh, several other 2D6 games. Welcome, Omar. Hey. Hello, welcome. Nice to have you here. Thanks. So let's uh, let's discuss a bit. Uh, what are you doing now? What are you preparing um, in terms of role-playing games, of course? Right now, I'm working on uh, several projects related to Cepheus Deluxe. Uh, one of them is a second uh, printing of this rule set, which about which there will be more news soon because there will be several surprises about it. Uh, which will have better graphics and uh, a better layout because we want to give our uh, customers the best experience possible. Of course, we also uh, ensure that the layout will be as readable as possible because this is what our customers usually like about our uh, products in addition to the contents. Also, we are working on uh, Terra Horizon, which is uh, a new version of this Stars Are Ours, our uh, space opera setting for Cephas Deluxe and other uh, 2D6 systems. Uh, both of them will be ready this year. Uh, Terra Horizon will be ready around this summer, I think in July, if we will uh, make everything in time. And the second printing of Cephas Deluxe will be ready around December. In addition, we're working on some content for our other products, such as Barbaric, which are, is our lightweight sword and sorcery rule set. Uh, we want to, to publish a setting for it called Rusted Sense, which is a sword and planet, sword and planet setting. Um, we also sort of sword and sorcery included in it. Uh, we are working about this as well, and potentially a new version of some of our adventures, including one for Barbaric, which will be translated into OSE, also School Essentials, which is called, it came from the Scriptorium. Uh, it's a horror adventure, very difficult horror adventure, high lethality, uh, like a horror adventure has to be. And uh, we are preparing it now for uh, Old School Essentials with new graphics and new map. Uh, to again to provide everyone with the best experience possible. Yes, I, I, I was browsing. Sorry, let me say that I was browsing the all the titles on Drive Two just before, and that adventure immediately uh, got my attention because it's like, oh, it's horror and uh, fantasy. <laughs> yes, it will. It will also have a new cover, I think, and new graphics in general. We have already commissioned them. Uh, also, the barbaric version will have in all the new graphics in it because right now we used very simple graphics to permit very affordable price. But uh, now it will have everything uh, ready for uh, perfect quality and uh, everything is now written, everything is prepared uh, to take everything to the next level. As I, you, I was saying, um... That's a, a long list of uh, of things to be launched. Are you the author of all that, or you have other people uh, not working? Not of Scriptorium. Scriptorium is done by another person, but uh, I'm one of the authors of Cephas Deluxe and of Terra Reason. I'm the main author of both, but I'm not working alone. It's all everything is teamwork in Stellagara Publishing. <laughs> when did your uh, publishing company started? In 2016. Uh, we started uh, in actually we wanted to publish this stars are ours so we started a company we published a few other things before and uh, I think our greatest success began with Cepheus Light which is a previous version of Cepheus Deluxe we started selling very very well as well as uh, this stars are ours but uh, Cepheus Light sold even better because people wanted a lightweight, simple, streamlined to the six system, and this is what they wanted essentially. And Cephas Deluxe is even more successful than that. It's our most success successful product so far. 
which re- reached Mitral best seller rating on Drive Through RPG. So, um, Cepheus started uh, before, and uh, there's nothing to do with Telegram, right? No, no. It began uh, because several reasons related to Traveler. Uh, because the second edition of Traveler came out, and there were problems with the licensing, so people, publishers, organized a new version based on the SRD, uh, which is, uh, for people who don't know it, it's a... Uh, some sort of a free basic reference document for the system, which the publisher can't take back. If they publish it as, as open game contest as SRD, it's SRD for all, all time, for eternity. So uh, we use this. Originally, Samardan, play, uh, Samardan Printing used it. And they, it was publishing, sorry. And they created a new game called Cepheus Engine. Now we took it and took some liberties in translating it into a new system. Uh, it's, Cepheus Lite was still very close to Cepheus Engine SRD, but it has several uh, important changes, which again we streamlined ship co- starship combat and vehicle combat. Uh, we made the, all the basic mechanics simpler and then we published in 2021 Cepheus Deluxe which is completely reimagined version of Cepheus Engine we simply didn't feel any need to stick to any uh, official line or official rules we simply built what we wanted and what our playtesters wanted Yeah, I was going to have that on my list was the question, what was the difference between Cepheus Light and Cepheus Deluxe? But you more or less explained it. So the Cepheus Deluxe is actually a different system. It's a different system based on the same basic concept. They are relatively compatible, but not completely so. Uh, again, because we took more liberties with Cepheus Deluxe. What I've seen, uh, Barbaric is also... A little bit different from the from the original. Yes, Barbaric is based on the Quantum Engine, which is a very radical uh, simplification of Cepheus Engine. Uh, so far, that we call it a different engine because it began from a two-page rule set. I created uh, because of a bet. Someone said, "Well, you can't create something lighter than Cepheus Light." I said, "Okay, I'm going to to make a one sheet rule set." called Cepheus Quantum. After that, we saw that uh, it, was, it is, of course, free because we don't, we don't take money for something of this uh, size. It's, so uh, you could even put a link for it in the description. And uh, Cepheus Quantum was quite a success. So we decided to use its engine to write more complex rules. Complex is a very relative term here because uh, still Barbaric is about 50 pages and uh, Cepheus Atom, which came before Barbaric, is even shorter. And there is also Quantum Starfarer, which is a very lightweight uh, the science fiction rule set. All of these use the Quantum Engine. We even have uh, third, publi- third party publishers publishing for the Quantum Engine. A lot of those uh, 50 pages are uh, spells and uh, equipment and all that. Spells so and monsters yeah. and the magic system and the critical hit tables because one of its more complex parts is uh, you have, uh, if you make critical hit or special attack, you could do all sorts of uh, weird and interesting damage. Mm-hmm. And you have the spell list because we also wanted spells to be selected randomly if you want. Uh, Barbaric uses a relatively dangerous magic system, which is similar to that of uh, the Sword of Cepheus, uh, which is our previous uh, Sword and Sorcery rule set, which is based on Cepheus Light, which is much larger in scope. And this magic system has a chance for failure, that is, you don't have a daily limit on spells, just most spell casting takes 10 minutes rather than immediately, and every time you cast a spell, you have a chance of failure, and failure could do very, very nasty things. <laughs> Up to killing you, which is 
less common, but could do all sorts of mutate you and bring all sorts of uh, nasty creatures to the environment. So it's like it's closer to our magic is depicted in Conan the Barbaric or uh, Elric or all sorts of sorts and sorcery literature rather than uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's less, uh, less easy to use. Yes. I, I also like that uh, approach to magic. So I, I take it that you were a traveler fan before this, I think. Right. Yes, I began with uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Second Edition in the 90s, but then I moved to Shadowrun and to Traveler, Classic Traveler, uh, which I got the reprints of because back then it was one of the only thing in print in the late uh, 90s, at least what I could get. And uh, I played a lot of Traveler. I wrote a lot of uh, fan material for Traveler. I even wrote an official supplement for Traveler because the first edition of uh, Mongoose Traveler had a logo license, which means you could publish official material for it with very, very limited limitations. So uh, it's called Outer Veil. Vale. It's a setting for the near future, near Earth setting for Mongoose Traveler first edition, which, is, which was my first publication. And later I started Stellagama Publishing. I didn't. Um, I didn't uh, accompany all that. Uh, uh, what's happened before with Mongoose and Traveler? I played Traveler a long time ago. It wasn't uh, the classic one. It was one of those uh, offshoots of Traveler. Yes. I can't remember which one. One of those. Um, but I, I have the feeling that some people were uh, and were not pleased with the Mongoose version. With the original version, most people sure. were pleased. Yeah. The problem was that with the second version, there were several things people didn't like, and there was a licensing situation I don't want to get into in this inter interview, mm -hmm. but a lot of people were uh, promised things and other things happened, and a lot of uh, anger around this, but uh, again, both versions of Mongoose Traveler are very good games. I prefer the first. Uh, but uh, I think that Cepheus Engine created something new, which is a new ecosystem. There are tens or dozens of uh, publishers. Uh, last time I checked, it was about 700 Cepheus Engine products, not just Cepheus Deluxe or Cepheus Lite, but all sort, all mm -hmm. kinds of Cepheus Engine products on Drive Through RPG. It opened up a gate for a lot of cre creativity. It was mm -hmm. something else that uh, surprised me because about three years ago, I was just buying, um, let's say, commercials, uh, commercial products. And then I started discovering the, the smaller publishers and, uh, well, the, the less mainstream products. And uh, it seems that there are several large products and, of course, uh, OSR based on fantasy D and D, of course, uh, is one of those, and then there's two D six, which is a very yes. large market, also. Yes. And yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't uh, aware that it that that um, well, I was aware of obviously of D and D uh, and its uh, repercussion, but not uh, about two D six. It's not as uh, probably not as well known. When did this yeah. start? Uh, when when did this started uh, happening? Uh, the open to the six market is, yeah. it was with Cepheus Engine SRD published around uh, 2016, um, which started again. It it was a very easy platform to work with because the rules are completely modular. You don't have dependencies. By the way, one of the problems with some of the newer editions of Dungeons and Dragons from uh, developers from a uh, an author's uh, point of view is that everything depends on everything else. And if we make changes, they change the entire system. Here, uh, like in OS, uh, most OSR games, there are much fewer dependencies, so you could change, you could plug and play, you could, if you want to take the, even you could take Mongoose Traveler and insert part from Cepheus Engine SRD if you want, and nothing will, nothing bad will happen. Everything will work relatively well. One other yeah. thing that usually uh, people, I think it's what uh, gets people into this uh, kind of games is that you can play a lot of things with the same rule set that you know 
since you started playing 20 or 30 years ago. And, yes, uh, this, uh, it's, uh, Traveler originally was intended as a toolbox to play all sorts of uh, science fiction games. Essentially, every, every kind of uh, science fiction game was supposed to be played with it. Later, they had a setting, which is a famous third imperium, but uh, originally it was intended, it very openly, in, explicitly intended to be a toolbox you could play anything mm -hmm. on. A classic traveler, you want to play modern games, no problem. You want to play even uh, fantasy games, you just have to add a magic system. Uh, it's very flexible. And because Cepheus Engine evolved uh, from it, again, it is very uh, adaptable system. It's very easy to change it. There are already uh, products by several other publishers. Uh, related to Cepheus Engine uh, in every genre possible, essentially for Westerns to time travel, traveler to the original science fiction. So let's say uh, you're doing a horror game with 2D6. What do you add to that? For a horror game, there are uh, essentially most of the rules already work for it. Uh, you don't have sanity mechanics. Uh, mm -hmm. so far, but everything else, it's uh, already in the market. There is even an Aliens game that is uh, called, it's called Hostile, it's by Zozer Games, mm -hmm. which yeah. is better. In we the haven't played of... it, but we have that one. Yes, <laughs> you should and, play it. And Zaibatsu also. Yes, so this is some sort of horror game. Again, it doesn't go into uh, stress and sanity and things like that, but everything else is in place. Especially as Cepheus Engine is a very little system, so uh, if you want uh, lethality like in Call of Cthulhu, there is no problem with it. It's already mm -hmm. baked in. Yeah, yeah even uh, Traveler, it was a, a very little game. Yes. And f f well famous for the the possibility of dying while creating a character. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. ask if Sphere. I don't know. I don't know the the game uh, so well yet. I know I will <laughs> probably in the future. Uh, but uh, does the ca the character creation? It's like Traveler. Do you have the chance of of dying? In Sphere's Deluxe, uh, it's only optional. Mm -hmm. Even in Traveler, it was optional relative from the beginning, but there in Cephas Deluxe, it's very optional. You have a certain chance of being injured and requiring cybernetics, but you don't have to die in character <laughs> creation. There are other limits to it. There, are very, there were very good reasons for this character generation in Traveler. Uh, again, to, to create some sort of a gambling mechanic mm -hmm. and balancing out the desire to have as many skills and benefits as possible with something else. It makes sense. Uh, yeah, I like it. I like the, the pathway creation. But we did have an experience. We, were, we played uh, Trevor recently, and it was only one session. But one of the players, he really wanted to make what, what was the... The career uh, that he wanted. Pilot, I think. No, no, no. It was the harder one. Scout. No, I'm missing scout. the word. Scout. He wanted to be a scout. So he did like 10 characters and he was like, okay, I give up. And we were telling him, come on, I want to play. Well, in Cepheus Deluxe, you could choose your career. You could choose your skills. You only have random events, which could bring mm -hmm. about injury if you want. But everything <laughs> else is a much more it gives much more control to the players than Cepheus Engine SRD or Traveler or even, even Cepheus Light. Mm -hmm. I like the, the random the, the, to have those events because it helps you create your character while you are generating it. I'm not sure if uh, that if, if it was uh, well probably Traveler invented that uh, life path um, concept I think. Yes. But it it was used by, by several other games. I think it's um, it's good for people to develop a character right then at character creation without having to think about it. You just roll the dice and you yes. get some events. And you have you have uh, in Traveler you have relatively random characters. Some people really like it. Others have a problem that you want you want a space marine and you get a thief. <laughs> It yeah, happened then. in our, in the Cepheus Light plate uh, playtest game. Uh, the rogue had better gun skills than the marines. 
but now yes. it's in Cepheus Deluxe, you choose what you want, you play the character you want, you just have random events and uh, uh, to spice up everything. Okay, so uh, we, you, you mentioned that um, the those products that were published published already for the for Cepheus cover all the genres. Uh, most of them in proper uh, Lovecraft and horror, there are still there are still no games. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a cyberpunk game even there's I think even several. Uh, pure historical gaming is also possible. I don't know if a complete system, but there are a source book for it. Almost everything is covered from fantasy to southern sorcery, to time travel, to uh, Western, to modern gaming. Uh, you have a hard science fiction setting also by those other games mm -hmm. uh, called Orbital uh, 21, uh, to sorry. Uh, you have a huge range of products and settings and source books available. So, and everything is relatively compatible which is, uh, with each other. But even the space operas, uh, I think they aren't as, um, as I say, uh, epic as, let's say, Star Wars, for example. Yes, in Cephas Deluxe, we have an optional mechanic of hero points mm -hmm. to make things uh, more epic and less little. But again, it's optional if you want to play it harder and grittier, you simply ignore this uh, this rule. Mm -hmm. If you want something pulpy, you could simply add this rule and things will look much more uh, epic and heroic. So let's talk a bit about uh, these stars are ours. Uh, yes. Tell us about the setting and what you are going to change when in this uh, new edition. Uh, this is a space opera setting, in, also inspired by UFO lore and by several uh, franchises and uh, artwork related to UFO lore. Essentially, the Greys came to Earth, conquered us, ruled us for uh, over a century, then we rebelled and became an inter interstellar power. And essentially, finally, after uh, 30 years of war, there is peace. A very uneasy peace and the interstellar politics become very heated because uh, first of all there is Terran expansionism and there, is, there are the aliens who want revenge, there are other aliens uh, who switch sides during the war and I think also the war creates frame of reference. Uh, you could say well my character participated in this, this and that battle based on based on uh, how many terms you made in your uh, character creation uh, you could say we that several characters were involved in the same military operations or as uh, civilians in the same uh, events and uh, the new edition is not exactly an addition it's a, a a new telling of the story called terra horizon which is a shorter product it has more worlds in it, more stars in it. Uh, it's adapted to Cepheus Deluxe because uh, this stars are ours is for Cepheus Engine SRD. Now it's completely and directly compatible with Cepheus Deluxe. Uh, we also had, had new artwork. Uh, the, original rules, the original setting was very sparse in terms of artwork. Uh, and new layout and uh, we try to focus the setting more now one of our mistakes i think in the original setting was that we wrote too much too much lore too much text and when the average referee or player comes to such a book uh, some of them don't have time to read everything they want stuff to use in their games as soon as possible so we we consolidated everything and focused on adventure hooks. Every paragraph, I think, in, in a setting must include a, one hook, at least, if not multiple. And uh, we also have explicit adventure uh, hooks about each world in the setting. We have over a hundred. Uh, there is an adventure uh, hook, uh, adventure seed chapter, which is quite large. 
And uh, again, it's going to be a very useful product if you want to run Space Opera and uh, in a very tense military and uh, political situation. Are there scenarios for, uh, for the Stars Are Ours? There are two adventures. Uh, we, there will be more soon. And we will convert them to, uh, to Cepheus Deluxe as well in the near future. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you play, sorry, just to clarify, you can play both, you know, the, mil the military side, of course, but you can also play the political intrigue. You could play both or ignore this and play more mm -hmm. uh, typical free trader or explorer game in this mm -hmm. setting. But you have the option to get involved in all sorts of espionage and uh, all sorts of uh, military unofficial military operations. Officially there is peace, but everything under the surface is burning yet. And again, it's not a, a purely military, mil sci-fi uh, setting, mm -hmm. but you can use it for it. It's not a completely a political setting, but again, you could play political games. Everything is open, it's a sandbox. Uh, yeah, so it's for, for everything, great. <laughs> you can play whatever you like, yeah. Yes. It's good. So uh, I was checking here on drive through There are other, um, I'm not sure what they are, but the, okay, you said two adventures. So what is this? Uh, Signal, Signal 99 and uh, the Wreck in the Ring. Mm. 50 Wonders of the Reticle and Empire. What is this? It's an old uh, gearbook for mm. uh, advanced technology. Mm -hmm. Now it's incorporated in Cepheus Deluxe. Oh, yeah. Okay. And for the previous edition, we are moving everything forward in terms of rules. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you have concentrated more on rules than the than settings, I think. Uh, other than the sisters are ours and all, everything around it, we really focused on rules because uh, uh, there are several advantages. People really like rules even more than settings, in my experience. Uh, in terms of sales, and sales represent interest. That is, adventures are less interesting to a lot of people because only the referee, the game master, uh, wants to buy them. The same goes with settings in most, uh, with most cases, and rules are for everyone. Everyone wants to play, uh, wants several of them, usually in PDF, by the way. Most of our products are sold as digital products, even if, if they have uh, print options. Again, people are nowadays used to play it with a searchable PDF, bookmark PDF on their computer or tablet. Uh, this is how I run games uh, nowadays. In Roll20 yes. and uh, Discord and all the, every, all the rules and adventure material open on my computer. Yeah, me too. But sometimes I just I can't find something in the computer and just okay, let's let me just look yes. at the book. <laughs> but that's me. But yeah, I have everything. And sometimes I just open different copies of the book to have the different uh, chapters that I want, so I don't have to waste time browsing through the through the PDF. Yes. Lately, we are playing online, so we end up obviously using more the PDFs than the books because obviously it's uh, easier. To do it, but I still like the books best, so it's uh, yes. I'm an old I'm an old man. <laughs> Me too. I really like having uh, books, physical books, uh, especially when I play person to person. Yeah. But uh, I see that a lot of people moved to the digital world. Uh, we have a support for our products in the virtual tabletop called Foundry. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them we have in Roll Twenty, but Roll Developing material for one twenty is much more difficult because of technical reasons. So, Cephas Deluxe, for example, doesn't have a character sheet there. But on Foundry, there is a module called the uh, 2D6, which supports everything from Traveler to Cephas to Barbaric uh, in a very extensive uh, way. It's also made uh, pro bono by several people. Uh, which is, uh, and they invest a lot of effort in it. 
because we think that during the pandemic and even after the pandemic, people want to play online. It's easier. You don't have to play only with people in your vicinity. We play worldwide. So a lot of people I know play online. I think most nowadays it's almost most people. Yeah, I think after, mm -hmm. after those uh, those times when we can, couldn't really play it uh, in person, a lot then, of people then we got used. Yeah, I, I didn't. I really didn't like um, the idea, the concept of playing online, and I had never played online actually uh, until uh, two years ago, I think. And now I'm playing online always. Yes, me too. Most of the time, some of it uh, offline, but uh, usually I run stuff online. It's it's much easier. It's a lot simple to get people. Oh, I can come this day. No, you just need one hour and sit in your computer. It's a lot easier. That makes someone coming uh, come to your house. Yes. Also easier to to create. Now I see that uh, even when playing in person, people use Roll Twenty as a map device. <laughs> uh, in one of our Savage Worlds groups where I play. Uh, the Game Master simply has a flat TV placed on the table, a very large one, uh, with uh, the map loaded from World 20 and it could reveal uh, whichever part we explore in the dungeon, it's the it's Pathfinder version of Savage Worlds. And uh, it's very comfortable, we place the miniatures on the TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh... It is something. Uh, the, the only problem I, f I see in uh, Roll20 is that uh, the images are too small, the, the video, yes. the screen. Is... Foundry is better in that. I never tried Foundry. There are several. There is also Roll. Uh, uh, even the, though uh, Astral is now being phased out, so there is still a very large market. Yeah. With a lot of competitors in this field. A lot of people also use Discord, right? Yes. It's, I think it looks better for for uh, interaction. There's yes. other problems, of course. If, uh, you don't have those maps and all that stuff. We usually combine. We use the Discord mm -hmm. for the sound because it's better, and Roll Twenty for the map. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we played with some, with, uh, with someone that did, did did it like that also. Yeah, and we're like, but why are we doing like this? And he was like, oh, because the sound is better in Roll Twenty, yes. but we in in Discord, but we have the maps, and we're like, okay. <laughs> Yes. So um, let's go back again. So uh, to the beginning, um, you started, uh, you said in the 90s, right? I started playing in the 90s in high school. Uh, back then in Israel where I lived, there was only, almost only Dungeons and Dragons and second edition Advanced Dungeons of the Dragons, which was out of print, so books circulated, were photocopied, people had old dice. Uh, back then there was much less international commerce, uh, online international commerce in these terms. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, we played it, we simply had the three core books, one of the photocopied, the, the Dungeon Master Guide, and we played the hell out of it, before we discovered other uh, role-playing games which were difficult to get at the beginning from the after the turn of the century it was much easier getting other games uh, but uh, in retrospect it's it was a relatively complex system the second edition of Dungeons and Dragons uh, nowadays when they play uh, d20 games uh, it's usually OSE or Nave which are much simpler uh, based on uh, basic, basic and expert Dungeons and Dragons, uh, which I think in the retrospect were better rules, uh, were simpler, were easy to use, were very modular. And then I found Shadowrun again out of print in a used bookstore. Uh, which I was hooked to because of the setting, despite the rules be being very, very complex. You know, the buckets of dice for everything, mm -hmm. but the setting is perfect. It's very gonzo, uh, out of there, uh, tall with pink mohawk, a minigun rushing against corporate drones and everything, like the uh, bug spirits and everything. But after that, I got Traveler again from in a very weird way, out of the trunk of the seller's uh, car 
because again it was he was a person who came to conventions to sell all sorts of exotic uh, role-playing material stuff so between conventions you could call him and he will come if he was uh, around and you buy from his car this is how 1999 you you purchase stuff yeah we're very but, lucky now and some people don't, don't even have an idea what happened when there was no online commerce yes we couldn't get anything here in portugal was the same it was very hard to get to get books yes uh, and uh, there was there were almost no game stores here uh, once i got traveler i started playing it in shadowrun then i returned to dungeons and dragons in its uh, third edition uh, originally we enjoyed it quite a lot but uh, the problem was that prepping for it is uh, a huge chore it's very very difficult to prep unless you want to do everything by the book if you want to create new material it's a lot of work so I discovered, I think in 2008, I discovered Basic Fantasy RPG, BFRPG, which is a retro clone, it was one of the first OSR games. From there I progressed to other OSR games, to X, to uh, OSE, to Swords and Wizardry. I think that OSE is one of the easier to use one in terms of, in term of uh, layout. It's very faithful to the original, but uh, I'm in actual play, despite the liking Axe very much, I'm moving to Nave. For the most part, because uh, again, relatively short games, some of them one off, and you don't, if you have three hours a week to play, you need something that gives you the best bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. Your um, experience in those early days seems not. Uh not that different from mine um well i didn't buy anything from a trunk of the car but, <laughs> but there weren't uh, many stores well, well there aren't many stores yet uh so how was uh, the evolution in israel of uh role-playing games in the community are there lots of people playing or is there are there stores clubs or uh, conventions it began in the 80s with the box dd with bx dnd mm -hmm. Uh, which was translated back then you simply had to, to have a publisher translate and publishing everything then the same publisher moved to a uh, second edition they didn't uh, translate the first edition and uh, they went out of business because they did try to do too many conventions <laughs> wanted to have a convention several times a year and have a huge convention and it wasn't commercial it was a commercial success uh, then people were playing Dungeons and Dragons for a lot of time. Still, most of people, most people here play Dungeons and Dragons. It's like uh, games workshops, games in uh, miniature wargaming. Everything plays it. Mm -hmm. Everyone plays it. Uh, there is some readiness today for uh, other games, but again, the market is still very dominated by Dungeons and Dragons. Fifth edition was not translated into Hebrew because of various licensing reasons. It's much, much more difficult to translate it than previous editions uh, because of new requirements by Wizards, Wizards of the Coast. Uh, so people play it. There is a translation of its SRD and people play it in uh, English usually, using the English book and playing in Hebrew. Uh, but uh, now, last year, people translated the uh, Source and Wizardry uh, into a box game, a beginner box, and now they are now working on an expert box. Uh, and the, the advantage, it's very, very cheap. It's mm -hmm. 99, she 99 shekels, it's like $30 for the entire box with dice and everything. Uh, which is, uh, they are marketing it to parents, they say, well, you could have a huge amount of play with a comparatively tiny price. Board games usually cost three times, at least three times of that. Uh, I think that now this is the way OSR is evolving here. Also, Nave was tra translated, but it's uh, less common. Uh, so there is an OSR community. Uh, there, now there is a translation of Savage Words Pathfinder. Also, Pathfinder was translated. Uh, the original Pathfinder, the first edition. But uh, Savage Words is also taking a hold here. 
and people who are more knowledgeable about role playing games uh, simply order stuff online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there are no print of demand print on demand services locally, but you could it's a problem because Hebrew is written the opposite direction from English. A draft RPG does work with it. Lulu doesn't. So if you want to print a book in Hebrew, you either go to offset printing, which is a huge economic uh, risk, mm -hmm. or you use it through drive through RPG and say, well, this product is in Hebrew. You could and people could order it, but uh, it's less comfortable. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned several uh, translations. Uh, the, the Israeli community prefers to, to read in, in your own language than English. I, I, have to, I tend to believe that people usually read the, the original books. I don't know. Maybe not. We only had one book but, uh, translated in Portugal. Yeah. Right. It was only the one of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Nothing there else are, was translated. There are translations to Portuguese, but to Brazilian Portuguese, not uh, European Portuguese. So. I, I tend to to think uh, well. That's for me. Role playing games are in English, nothing else. I know that there are translations, of course. The French translate a lot of things. Yes, we translated uh, some of our rules to Spanish. Yeah, I saw some... that. I was going to ask you about that. Oh, yeah. Barbarian. Yes, I saw. Uh, it, there is not a very large demand for it, okay, because of the reasons you noted that. Most people in the Latin speaking world simply play in English, use English books. But uh, Cephas Deluxe will soon be published in Spanish as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we may be able to do crowdfunding for that, but this is an interesting subject you will know about mm -hmm. in a few weeks, I think. Yeah, the Spanish, they tend to have, they have their nuts. Their, their own games. role playing industry, yes, so they have games and they have some interesting games that were never uh, translated to English and that don't exist anymore. One of them is Cap Capitan, Capitan Alatrista, that is a game that I would like to play, but it's only in Spanish and it's not even in print. But yeah, the Spanish do have uh, a market, yes, but again, it's a relatively closed market, mm -hmm. or otherwise, they play in English, yeah. Uh, but there is an Italian translation as well, uh, which was simply done freely by someone who wanted to have an entire version for the group, so they shared it with us. Uh, there is also going to be a free translation of the Cephas Deluxe SRD. Uh, it's into Spanish. Uh, again, people want, want to play it in their own language. Uh, most adults in Israel know English relatively well. Uh, because we all of our television in English is with subtitles, so you hear the language. Uh, some people know Spanish relatively well because all telenovelas are in, in Spanish now in <laughs> Korean and Turkish as well, but usually in Spanish. Uh, so people are exposed to foreign languages relatively well by entertainment. But younger people who don't have the language skills yet, uh, it's much easier if you have a local translation. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm facing that with my with my niece. I would like to start playing with her, and I'm, but she's seven years old and she doesn't. She just learned how to read, so <laughs> she can't read in in English. So I have to translate the the games for for her so that we can play. So yes, yes. to start kids earlier, it's it's a good way. Translations are good for that. Yes. So there are uh, are there large uh, conventions in Israel? Uh, there are usually two conventions a year. We didn't have them for uh, two years now. There is going to be one in the summer uh, called Draconicon. There is another Draconicon overseas, I learned about it, but uh, it's a large convention. There are other fantasy conventions, but not too many because it's a small country and small community. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually uh, it's a good place to buy stuff and to meet people. I, I play less in convention games because usually uh, it's relatively difficult to run a very effective convention game in my experience. But uh, I do run from time to time local material. I'm going to run, I think, uh, Cephas Deluxe in the next convention or Barbaric, which is easier to run in a convention because the character creation is about two minutes. And you you want to usually in such games you want to create characters as part of the convention game rather than being pre-generated pre uh, characters. What about game designers? 
things are developing here relatively rapidly uh, because there is Savage Worlds in, uh, in Hebrew, which is going to be published very soon. Uh, the Pathfinder, there are a lot of new options. So the Wizardry, a lot of new options for people to come to the hobby. Even younger people without, mm -hmm. uh, and then once you have people in the hobby, some of them become developers. Um. Seafuse and all those games are old school, but usually they aren't mentioned. Um, as, well, I mean, they are mentioned as uh, traveler uh, retro clones or something like that, but uh, there seems to be some kind of uh, division there. I don't know. It's, uh, it it's a, a subgroup, I think. I'm not sure. Yes. Uh, I don't think in comparison to travelers, there are people who. Uh, prefer traveler over Cepheus or Cepheus over traveler, but uh, there is separation between the, tra the traveler or Cepheus communities and the D20 based OSR community. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbaric and such games are probably bridging some of it, but uh, I found also find out in games that it's much easier to find players for D20 games mm -hmm. because they know the basic mechanics. Usually, if they played a few times, they know what armor class is and attack bonus and everything. Uh, some use deco, but uh, so OSE is very, very popular, uh, much more popular thing than Cepheus and any even more popular than official traveler. Uh, again, because it's people know it very well, know the mechanics, and there's a huge D20 community. Uh, but Cepheus is gaining ground, I think, uh, because D20 can work for some sort of sci-fi, but not for all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, for a harsher version of sci-fi, you have to work much more, much harder to create uh, an effective rule set for that. Yeah, you have to change it almost until it's not the same game anymore. Yeah, I yeah. think Cepheus is more, uh, I'm missing the word, versatile. The, most of the, the D20 games are uh, fantasy. There are others, uh, other genres, but most of them are really, you know, the sword and sword and sorcery and the, the high fantasy. <laughs> there, I think there's more variety in the, in the Cepheus side. Yes, because D20 has a very, very specific power curve. Uh, and the class structure, but the power curve is, is the main uh, feature. You need, it works for settings where you start from zero and go to hero. Otherwise, uh, you find that there was an attempt to create a D20 traveler game. It had difficulties because you had to enter the class system and the level system into a game which is classless and levelless. Uh, it required a lot of hard work for this to be published. But uh, I think that every kind of rule set works for others for different things. If you want gritty science fiction, uh, so D two D six work better than D twenty. If you want uh, heroic fantasy, D twenty works very well. Sword and sorcery both work because it's a spectrum. You could have heroic sword and sorcery. You could mm -hmm. have very very gritty sword and sorcery. And Cepheus and Barbaric lean to the grittier side. There's one thing that I like about um, 2D6 games, that uh, I can play a character that isn't uh, much younger than I am. It's something <laughs> <laughs> I have a problem with that. So I, I can play a character with 45 or 46, 46 or 47. It's usually you can do that with uh, if you are following the rules, of course. If you are yes. playing a, a level one character in a uh, typical OSR game, it's a bit strange. That if you are playing a fifty-year-old guy, no, it can't be. Yes, usually it be. you're fresh off the farm. Yeah, <laughs> and that I I I really can't do that. <laughs> I should have been used to it by now, but no, I always uh, play characters who are veterans. I prefer that yes. way.
so it's easier to do it when, uh, with the careers. Uh, it turns it, uh, well, it, it makes yeah. sense. Yes, uh, you know, when you're younger, so traveler cultures feel so old. Yeah. You know, the time 40 is around my age, sometimes they're younger. So somewhere, somewhere between 10, 26 and uh, 54 usually, they are often older characters. Sometimes the traveler, you, it could be uh, around 70, if you really, really, if you, the dice want this to be 70 <laughs> in traveler. But uh, usually it's in your 30s and in your 40s are experienced adults, experienced and competent adults. This is uh, the essence of uh, 2D6 characters for the most part. Uh, if let's, uh, if you pick uh, Cepheus looks and uh, play it as as it is, it's more of a uh, hard sci-fi or more of a space opera game. It's a uh, medium hard, I think. Okay. It's somewhere between. Uh, it's like uh, where should I place it? Around Babylon Five, I think, mm -hmm. which is it's space opera, but it's not the most. Uh, Gones of space opera, mm -hmm. like Star Wars, for example, which is which borders on fantasy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's still you have a, a more a, a grittier view on the world, but you could still have sweeping space opera stuff. Um, as for uh, well, for besides Babylon Five, what would you say in, in terms of movies and uh, things that you like, for example? Things that I like in terms is some of the more video games like uh, well, Mass Effect, yeah. Uh, yeah, which is also somewhat closer to the atmosphere you get from Cephas Deluxe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really liked uh, Star Control 2, but Star Control 2 is, doesn't is very different from Cephas Deluxe. It's a humorous uh, space fantasy or uh, tongue and cheek. A space uh, fantasy game, but I really like. I played a lot of it. Uh, there were uh, usually same Mass Effect, is it? Uh, Firefly also fits if you want. If you want a free roaming merchant campaign, you could have. Mm -hmm. But the space above and beyond did some effect on our design, even above, even on our ship design. If you recall this series, mm -hmm. yeah, I like that one very much. Uh, generally, the more military side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up on, on a lot of uh, Larry Niven books, but they are less expressed here. It's very different technological assum assumptions and uh, levels of civilization. I grew up on uh, a lot of 70s uh, science fiction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a problem with with hard sci-fi because I have a it's mostly it comes from books right because the films are always less hard sci-fi even when they are hard sci-fi so sometimes I have problems uh, role playing it because you know seeing the world because reading a description in the book is not the the same thing so I prefer my sci-fi not really epic in Gonzo but not too much hard sci-fi because I don't know what my character should do Yes, hard sci-fi is a problem that if your players are uh, skilled in technological mat matters in physics, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's easier to play Star Wars with them because, you know, they don't expect it to be realistic. But if you try to play the expense, they say, no, you could do this, you can do that. And uh, I usually have less confidence running a very hard science fiction. Because again, it has to be realistic and uh, it's very difficult reality of rocket science and uh, astronomy and yeah. everything. So you weren't uh, that um, interested in technology? Uh, no, it's a matter that uh, hard science fiction requires, uh, if, you, if you want to be confident with, his, with it, you need a better knowledge of physics and mm -hmm. so, or at least better than that of the players. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah. you have a problem with suspension yeah. of disbelief. Yeah, that's Miguel it. has a problem with that. He always yeah. doesn't want to game master anything that is too hard sci-fi because. Yes. <laughs> no, because well, I am. Uh, my background isn't technological at all. I was a journalist, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. So there are spaceships yeah. and things. And we yeah, have okay. some players that are actually engineers and stuff, so they know so, yeah. a lot more about technology. <laughs> yes, in Traveler there are a lot of such people. It's uh, some of the gearhead stuff simply speaks 
to technological uh, literate people. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sifis Deluxe is a bit less on the engineering side of things. Uh, because most of the players we encountered playing our roles are uh, more into space operas than into art and fiction. Yeah. Well, I, I don't... Um, in this, I, I think I prefer... In movies, I probably prefer hard sci-fi, but that's something that you are uh, watching, not, not playing. So I, I really don't like space operas. I like Alien, for example, any of the any of the movies, and the, well, the, those are uh, probably easier to game master because uh, technology isn't that important, and it's kind of a it's a different kind of art sci-fi. It's gritty sci-fi, more yes. gritty than than hard. Yes, this is also what I like in sci- sci-fi. It is also like Alien. Mm-hmm. My older setting, Out of Veil, was uh, more inspired by, by Alien. Uh, which is diff- it's very gritty, it's not very hard. It could mm. look hard, but it doesn't deal with physics too much. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't get technical. Yeah, characters die, and it's so... Uh, you, you notice that they are real people, but then... Okay, th- that's realistic, but not in terms of technology. Yes. Uh, so it's... The, it, uh, the, have you played the game? Uh, the, the official game? No, no, only hostile. Mm-hmm. Which I am told is even better because it's the official game. I have it in print. Uh, it's very, it's visually stunning. Mm-hmm, yeah. I haven't had a chance to run it. I had a chance to run Hostile, mm-hmm. and I think its main problem is uh, its layout of light text over uh, black background in some places. Uh, for me, it's borderline uh, about my vision. That is, um, with glasses, I have no problem reading it, but I know some people will have a problem with that. But it's a beautiful book, and yeah. the system looks relatively well. I think that Hostile uh, speaks the language of Alien even better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the other one it's, uh, uses that uh, that system, that free league. As yeah. already, they 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 have a lot of fans. We so. we played it, but I don't think it would be that you could use it for a campaign. I think that the alien game would be probably for a short campaign or a a one shot. I don't see yes. it working as a, a a campaign. Yes, I think the setting itself, if you focus on alien, mm-hmm. it's always very short because your people are supposed to die. Yes. Exactly, oh. and you have the stress rules that, that they use, that free leagues use, because your character gets stressed. And <laughs> yes, because this is how the movies work. Yeah. But if hostile is a wider variety of things you could do in the universe. It's very, very gritty sci-fi, very industrial sci-fi. You're supposed to be working class people doing working class jobs in space, or be or at most space marines, uh, and. Uh, it's more varied universe than Alien. It doesn't focus only, of course, in the source book. You could have all the xenomorphs you want in it. Uh, you have an Android uh, source book, but uh, there is greater variety. It's, it even has a cyberpunk uh, related game mm-hmm. called uh, Zaibatsu, which is, I think, the best uh, cyberpunk game out there because it has hacking rules that actually work around the table. Uh, you know the, the famous Decker problem. Yeah. Uh, usually when people hack in cyberpunk games, uh, it's different mini game and everyone goes yeah. to drink coffee while the <laughs> game master runs uh, the I... encounter and then uh, the bats will simply play a simple card game about two minutes with the referee and enjoy it a lot and uh, that's it. Okay. No time for coffee break. That solves that solves that problem. I hate that the cyberpunk. Well, the cyberpunk rules are like the magic rules. It's a subset of things, and uh, you have yes. to you have to have another book just for that. I've never played Shadowrun. I think that Shadowrun had the same problem. It, it, yeah. it had both. It, it had magic more, and hackers. Yeah, yeah that's the, it. <laughs> it's a more extreme problem in Shadowrun. <laughs> Uh, it's similar to the data photos you had in older editions of Cyberpunk 2020. Mm-hmm. But uh, then you have Astra scouting by your mage and controlling vehicles by your rigger, and everything is very complex. Uh, some of it is very interesting, but 
there is always the weakness that some mini games are with one player and one play player alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that gets boring for for the other people. Yeah, that's so it. other people Sometimes go in the other direction and simply have one role for hacking, which is boring. Yeah, and, and the, the hacker sometimes solves everything, right? The fighter is there. I want to, okay, the, the I want to do something. No, the, the, the hacker did everything. The hacker uh, yes. opened the doors. The hacker turned off the alarms. So basically, it's the same as the magic, the magician. Yes. It is a, it's kind of magic. Um, so you haven't um, think of, you haven't thought about uh, doing something more um, towards the the hard sci-fi or the gritty sci-fi for your uh, well uh, of your own of course uh, again i did uh, write outer veil uh, mm -hmm. over a decade ago it's not hard sci-fi it's still it uses the traveler technology but it's very gritty uh, and we are considering a new future near earth uh, setting called the cradle of, cradle of stars but uh, we have other projects to complete first Again, the much more, uh, much closer to our technology level. Mm -hmm. No flying grav cars and everything like that. Closer to alien in flavor, uh, cyberpunkish in flavor. Uh, very close to us. We have uh, we flattened the near Earth star map for using traveler like games. Uh, it very it uses uses abstraction because space is. Uh, obviously three-dimensional three but it's easier in a game to have it flat in a, on a hex map mm -hmm. uh, i was gonna ask because i was looking i found another game that i thought uh, that that is interesting is uh, so let's talk a bit about it so feels that um so the post-apocalyptic uh, it's a fantastic post-apocalyptic game that is you have mutations that do positive things in reality, it all, all, only works that way in the fungi and bacteria, but uh, you have all kinds of mutants and uh, bizarre stuff and high technology you find in ruins. Uh, it's a very fast game, a very simple game. Again, you create characters in two minutes, I think, uh, very easily, and then you venture out into the post apocalyptic uh, wilderness and explore ruins and get eaten by mutants mm -hmm. and it can is also compatible with with barbaric right because yes, so like seeds yeah completely compatible so if you want to play one Thunder of those barbaric, 80, yeah then, one of those eight uh, 80s crazy sci-fi yes. fantasy uh, <laughs> films so you could do it out of the box with the, these two uh, books mm -hmm. would this something be like would, would it be something like fallout uh, it's uh, more Gonzo than Fallout. More Gonzo, yeah. Okay. Even the Fallout. Fallout is is medium yeah. Gonzo. It has its own. This Fallout too. It is talking plants and everything, but uh, it's still relatively uh, hard. Uh, and uh, this is closer to Gamma World or to hmm. Wasteland, if you know the. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about uh, yeah. Wasteland, and there is the the. the uh, I don't remember. Ah, border Borderlands. Yes. Maybe Borderlands is very gone, though. Yes. Okay. Uh, right. Well, if you have something else to talk about. Uh, no, I only wanted to say that there are going to be very interesting news about Cephas Deluxe in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, we only have to complete a few promotional uh, materials for it. And we are hard at work on this. I toned down my day job as a translator. Uh, to work on uh, Telegram publishing material most of the time. So now things are progressing uh, relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, well, we'll probably talk again uh, in the near future when you have uh, some more news about, uh, yes. about your yes. next releases. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, good luck for your for your projects and Thanks. everybody stay stay tuned for the the news yes in a couple of weeks all right okay thank you okay, thank, thank you, you Omar. goodbye bye bye